We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Folks, uh, it's great to have you all here with us to discuss what it is the future uh, after the pandemic, or to be honest, living where in a digital world that has suffered so much and has been pushed towards so much of digitalization. Uh, it would be fantastic to, to discuss this initiative for a post pandemic digital rights future. So, what we have today is, is been thinking about what it is to live in this uh, fantastic digital world and with all this, the challenges and opportunity that it brings to us today. We have been discussing what it is the possibilities, what are the main processes that we can provide to create this global governance regime, global governance system that will allow us to live in this concrete world, but also in a digital space together. So the last two years have shown us how important, how significant and how much we actually need the digital space. And, and again, how we are going to be able to live in this global, this global village with those different jurisdictions, different points of view, different, including regulations and including values as well. In the past, we have seen many different opportunities, many different initiatives as well, and uh, national and global initiatives. And we have today the opportunity to discuss with some of the most brightest minds of how to face these uh, challenges and opportunities, what are the main initiatives that we can follow. With us today, we have Ronaldo Lemos, which was one of the, not only the lawyer, tech and uh, technologist, but also one of the founding fathers of the Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights, Marco Civil of the Internet. And this, he will provide us with the opportunities of discussing what was the process that led to this fantastic and well famous legislation and piece of regulation. We also have today with us Sarah Wynne Williams, which is a Frontier Technology CEO for the Mindaro Foundation showing about her points of view of how important it was Marco Seville for, for, the, for the world and how it could be a template for many potential initiatives in the future. And also with us, Juan Carlos de Martin, which is not only a professor of the Polytechnic of Tur Turing, but also a co-founder and director of NEXA uh, to, to showcase what are the global implications of how the, what are the main possibilities that have happened in the past and how, for instance, Italy was one of the main countries that look at the Marco Seville of the Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights and saw an opportunity to expand and provide not only a framework, but also a, a potential point of regulation in the future. So our, our town hall meeting will later focus on some of the some of principles that we have developed in, uh, in during this initiative to provide an, a template and a starting point to a big discussion on what are the potential principles that we should gather for this initiative. So the part will have a round of uh, discussions with, amongst those three fantastic leaders and then we'll open the floor for a big discussion on the principles or 12 principles that we think will be set up a basis for a potential future consensus. So I'll handle the mic to Ronaldo Lemos for a few minutes, nine minutes to start, kick off our big discussion on the potential future of the post pandemic digital rights initiative. Thank you, Christian. Uh, it's really great uh, to be with you today. Uh, it's great to be with Sarah and also with my friend Juan Carlos de Martin, which I haven't seen for uh, quite a lot of time, but I think the, the pandemics is partially responsible for that too. So uh, in this uh, short initial uh, conversation, I would like to provide like some aspects of 
what happened in terms of governance and decision making in Brazil that actually led Brazil to build uh, one of the first successful Bill of Rights that actually exists uh, worldwide regarding internet and technology. So as you probably know, there has been a lot of efforts in different uh, places and instances about building uh, bills of rights uh, for the internet and for technology. Some of them uh, progressed really well. Some of them came up with interesting and important ideas. And I think like uh, Brazil was one of them that actually succeeded in terms of how you can approach that effort. So before I talk a little bit about the micro civil, uh, I would like to say that more than ever, initiatives to discuss, debate, and implement bills of rights regarding technology feel to me uh, important, relevant, and absolutely necessary for the moment we are living right now. So I think we are in a moment in which we all have identified the problems and the challenges that uh, technology has brought upon us. And from my perspective, being a Brazilian, someone that has been uh, on the field in precisely what happened in the experience of the micro civil in Brazil. So first we had like a civil society, the scientific community coming together with private uh, sector, the government and so on coming up with a, a broad discussion about the principles. Once that round was completed and we reached consensus about the key topics that were important uh, to deliberate in terms of norm setting, then we moved into the actual text that would make those principles concrete. So I think th that process in itself, in my view, uh, uh, is very valuable. And of course, if you're going to run that uh, again in the world that we live today, I think we have already evolved in terms of participatory technologies in how you basically collect uh, the experiences of different building initiatives. So in my view, uh, what happened in Brazil is very instructive to what can happen uh, right now in terms of resuming digital Bill of Rights initiatives. And just to conclude, I think like a, a couple of points that are important. Uh, this process that Brazil applied ended up being influential in many other places. Uh, for instance, in Italy, uh, in which it was uh, a sort of an inspiration for the Italian parliament also to address uh, the challenge of a Bill of Rights. At the time, uh, it was led by Stefano Rodotà, which is a preeminent uh, name if you think about digital rights in Europe. And Juan Carlos de Martin also participated uh, in those possibilities as well. So just to, to conclude, uh, you, you know, my point here is we are living in a moment in which we have a different kind of challenge from the global perspective. And in my view, in order to cope with that, with that challenge, we are going to need new institutions. So basically, we are going to have to exercise institutional imagination in order to cope with the different type of challenge that requires new institutions. Uh, I am a member of the, the Facebook Oversight Board. Actually, I should call them Meta now, uh, but uh, it's hard to, to, to get into that. But the point is the, the Oversight Board, I think is one tiny experiment showing that it is possible to try to design new initiatives and institutions that can cope with uh, these new types of challenges. But I really think we, we need to think even bigger. We need to think about, as Christian mentioned, a post-pandemic digital rights initiative that can get inspired by what happened in Brazil and projected elsewhere in order to build 
uh, a new institutional imagination process that can actually and effectively deal with the challenge that we have right now. Let me conclude now, and I'm very eager to hear from Sara and from Juan Carlos as well, and then we can resume on this uh, task and debate afterwards. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ronaldo. It's fantastic. You set the scenario for what we, we believe it's, it's the starting point of this initiative. So we have to look at the past, see what has been uh, achieved, what are the main processes, what are the main uh, important aspects that we can gather together and build on using, as you put it, your our creative imagination for, for the future. Now I want to, to talk to Sarah. Sarah, you were... Uh, you were not exactly involved in the process, but you were very close looking at the process when they were developed in Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights or Marcos Bill. And it would be very interesting to see from your global perspective, from your point of view, what was, uh, was important, what was uh, interesting aspects and how we can build upon those interesting aspects as you have seen to, in order to have this post-pandemic digital rights initiative. What are, are the aspects that created consensus? What are the aspects that created a legislation that was worth looking for and using as somewhat a uh, starting point for a, a much bigger discussion, uh, a global discussion? Thanks, Kristen. Um, I think one of the reasons Marcus Seville stands out to me is sitting here in December, 2021 and looking at the current internet governance framework globally, if you were starting from scratch, you wouldn't design what we have now at all. You, you would not approach a an, any aspect of it, I think, in the, in the way that we have. And so if you look back, and most of that's been put in place in the last decade, uh, most of the national laws that touch most upon technology are new. Um, or they are adaptations of uh, existing laws, trying to bring it closer to, you know, to address the huge impact that technology is having on society. And at the moment, um, one, one aspect of that is that there are literally thousands of open processes uh, on regulating different aspects of tech. And, and you can categorize that any number of ways you like. But if you were looking to release a technology product um, a decade ago, you would face a radically different landscape to, to what you have now. And we can debate the merits of, of that one way or another. Um, but I think you have to look at in that decade of radical expansion of legislation, policy development, all of that, where are there examples of, of really effective models, you know, and, and Marco Seville stands out and it stands out for a number of reasons. Um, interestingly, those are both process, which I think Ronaldo touched on and, and illuminated a lot. They're also on design, where I think a lot of very smart choices were made. Uh, and then they're on the substance. And I engaged um, with Marco Seville from industry, which is always an, an odd seat to have when a country is developing its own national framework. So, you know, I'm not Brazilian. Um, I wasn't directly at the table at this. Uh, and, and one of the things that I think is perhaps a marker of success um, for the process is that throughout the, the three years that Marco Seville was being developed, in, industry position on it changed radically. There were times where industry groups were putting out advertisements in national papers in Brazil saying, please pass Marco Seville. There were times when those same industry groups were saying, we have, we have to kill Marco Seville. <laughs> uh, and I think to me, that's actually a mark of success that shows you that there was no voice that dominated um, it was a very open process. Uh, and I think everybody who engaged, whether that's from the scientific community, the academic community, industry, civil society, uh, there were times where they felt that process was going in, in their interest and in their favor. And there, there were times where they felt it really wasn't. And that to me is a mark of a, a messy but effective process. Um, the, the other thing that I think on process was really effective is that 
all, all those voices were at the table and, but there wasn't too much weight given to any. And you had confidence that there were experts refining the decision-making. You, you were, you know, un, unlike some other processes, which I won't name, there was a real confidence that the people designing Marco Seville understood the technology or in, or in instances, and there were, you know, where there were a few where what was being suggested simply wasn't practical. You could have that conversation. You could say, look, is this log requirement actually going to work or, or what, whatever the specific provision was? Um, so again, I think that, that was really great. And there wasn't one voice that dominated and there was a place for expertise to rise to the surface. Again, that's um, something I've noticed in, in Brazil more generally, but really came, came to the fore. And I think you see that in the, in the result. And then I think the other, the, there were a lot of very smart design choices. And when I think about where we sit today, I think it's worth understanding why Marco Seville has endured and why it is, you know, even in recent months, been very topical, had, you know, very great impact in the politics of Brazil. And I think that's because there's a choice to frame this around principles and rights. And when you look at technology and you look at society, a lot of things at the very pointy end that technology pushes are, are issues of rights. And those involve trade-offs. Um, and, and you can think about those trade-offs in lots of different ways, but if you think about the, um, the very complex debate around encryption versus online safety and protecting vulnerable people in society, like those are very difficult trade-offs inherent because you have competing rights in some instances of that. And, and that is why having a rights-based framework that was look that was looking ahead to how do you create norms how do you create a permissive framework that will allow the debate to continue and to develop but will create some framework and some ability to give effect to those rights and have the discussion about those trade-offs again Marco Seville was very smart in doing that and if we look ahead now to what is needed in the internet governance uh, generally, I, I think is a framework to be able to have the discussion around those trade-offs. And at the moment that's happening, what I'm observing, and, and I stand to be corrected, is a lot of that is happening on the national level and you're having interest groups trading off on specific legislative provisions rather than abstracting it back to what are the norms we want in society? What should we be governed? Let, let's try to abstract and, and coming at it from a principled approach. So I think the work that, um, that we're hoping to, to seed around discussing potential principles comes back to those design choices. And then again, just finally on substance, I think there was a very considered and very effective choice of issues to be addressed. And I know that that changed over time. There are times where it was more ambitious and there are times where, you know, there are some, some things we're not going to get to. Um, and being able to understand that having some framework, even not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. So accepting that politics and, and open processes and um, grants, you know, from the, from the bottom up processes are going to involve trade-offs the whole way. Uh, I actually think it makes, the end result more enduring. So when I look back at having engaged in a decade or more of internet policy, for all of those reasons, Marco Seville really stands out. And it, to me, is the model that we should turn to when we look ahead and say, what does the next decade hold? But thanks for your time. I don't want to take up any more. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah. I think you had two very key uh, observations that I, I find it fantastic. First, you said it was sort of a, a messy process, but effective. I think this is this is a very good description of what we intend to, to propose, because it, it is sort of when, when you 
seek out for consensus and you seek out to build principles and rights, it, obviously it is sort of a, a difficult process in the beginning, but it, it, it actually builds very solid foundations. So this is a very good. And the second part, I think you mentioned that not having perfect in the enemy of enemy of good, it's also a very interesting way of looking at uh, building the, the, the building blocks for a, a global uh, governance initiative in terms of the digital digital space. And in that note, I, I want to call uh, to the mic Juan Carlos because he was at uh, the offset of one initiative in Italy that has took up a little bit about what has been done in the Marco Civil and build upon that to have uh, an interesting off Brazil initiative as well. So, Juan Carlos, what, what were your thoughts from what you have seen in Italy and how we can build upon that to have a global initiative, a global governance regime? So, thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. It's a pleasure to be attending this, uh, this meeting with you, with Ronaldo, with Sarah, and all the people attending uh, and listening and participating in this meeting. Uh, yes, indeed, this pandemic has uh, confirmed uh, the importance of looking at digital rights and considering them as an important, uh, crucial component uh, of the world that we want to shape in the future years, because we all of us have seen suddenly, sometimes uh, from one day to the next, uh, how uh, the digital technologies were essential for our job, for our personal life, uh, for education, for health. Uh, so if everything we've been saying for many years before the pandemic, now it's even stronger. We've seen the impact on inequality. We've seen what it means not to be able to access the internet uh, or not to have proper devices, uh, not to, to have a proper way of dealing with these devices. So uh, everything is even more sharp, is sharper and more important than it used to be. And certainly it's a, it's a very good idea to uh, launch again an initiative on digital rights uh, based on the successes of the previous years and of course uh, Marco Civil is rightly remembered and uh, and uh, held as a, an example uh, to, to draw inspiration uh, because it's true it's an important was an important piece of legislation that was passed in a very important country and uh, was indeed uh, one of the elements that inspired Italy as you already mentioned uh, we're thinking about 2013-2014 uh, when the Marco Civil um, uh, was being uh, discussed and then approved. And uh, back at the time, let me briefly remind the audience uh, of what happened uh, in, in Italy in those years. Uh, with Stefano Rodotà was a, not only a, a law professor, but uh, also a political figure and a public intellectual uh, with a strong voice uh, in many issues, including the, the issues related to digital rights. Uh, well, in those days, uh, we had a um, president of the Italian Chambers of Deputy, um, uh, Laura Boldrini, who was convinced that it was important for the Italian parliament uh, to say something about digital rights, and actually not just to say something, but to aim at, at not less, uh, anything less than issuing a declaration of internet rights. Uh, so we had actually a, a representative Molone in Rome telling the story of Marco Civil, and then shortly after that, uh, the Italian president of the Chamber of Deputies uh, it created a commission of a member of parliaments representing all political forces and experts, and I was one of them, and Stefano Dotta was our moral leader, so to speak. And in the following eight months, actually it was quite, uh, quite quick, actually almost less than a year, um, we uh, drafted this Declaration of Internet Rights that is available also in many languages, also in Spanish, in German, in Portuguese, etc. And... Um, uh, was not exactly stakeholder in the sense uh, uh, of some other initiatives because it was an initiative of the Italian parliament, uh, but there was an important component uh, of participation because we had uh, dozens and dozens of auditions. So I can say that uh, we audited uh, uh, essentially everybody, who, not only that it was important to, to involve, but also everybody who wanted to say something. And so those of the auditions were, um, uh, was very important. And also with a pretty lengthy and uh, um, consultation process. Uh, so we received the contributions of experts, uh, non regular citizens, industry association, etc. And therefore, the final declaration of internet rights uh, um, that um, was a strong improvement on the original draft that was uh, the one discussed during the consultation. So 
I can say that in the end, the Italian parliament uh, issued a declaration that was truly the outcome of the contribution of a very broad range of uh, experts, um, uh, industries, uh, and civil society organizations, uh, political parties, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So in the end, uh, uh, even though not literally, but the, the actual outcome was true, very much multi-stakeholder in that sense, even though it was issued by the supreme um, uh, institution of parliamentary democracy. Um, since then, the, the Declaration of Internet Rights in Italy has been a reference, and sometimes also referenced elsewhere, like the European Parliament and elsewhere. I think it stood the test of time uh, fairly well, because now and then, I personally and other people go back to the declaration. And even though in six years, many things changed, uh, I, we think that most of it, if not all of it, is, is still pretty much a uh, good reference to understand where we should go in principle. Um, currently, the challenge, if I can say something about the current situation, the challenge I see in Italy and perhaps also elsewhere in, in Europe uh, is um, the great emphasis on um, di everything digital at the European level, and then that percolates then at the national level as a sort of a instrumental tinge. So everybody talking about digital transformation as if it's purely a technological transformation. So there is a lot of talk about uh, Italy, uh, Italy and Europe being behind the US and behind China and that we have to catch up. Uh, so a lot of focus on that, which is fine. I'm, I mean, personally, I'm an engineer, so nothing against uh, an instrumental view of technology. But at the same time, the, the talk about rights uh, is maybe in this frenzy about digital transformation should be reminded more often. Uh, of course, we do have privacy. We do have um, some laudable uh, exceptions to what I'm saying. So we had you know, a proposed uh, draft regulation about AI. In Italy, actually, very recently, we passed a moratorium on the use of public recognition in public spaces, which I think is a very good exception to what I'm saying. But still, it's, I think it's a very good timing um, uh, for an initiative like the one we're discussing today to, to shine some light again on the topic of digital rights. Um, of course, it's not the only thing we should do. Digital rights is one component, has always been one component, an important component. We also need something else because as in the document produced by um, our friends um, at ITS Rio says we also have a, a huge issue of concentration of power and concentration of power you can deal with that uh, to some extent with rights but you need definitely something else you need uh, actually to show the, the, the force of democratic control of technology uh, with the help of rights but also with the help of other instruments in order to tackle concentration of power so uh, I welcome this initiative. We can contribute in any way. Of course, we would be very pleased to do so. And uh, let's hear, let's, uh, hear what the other participants have to say about this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan Carlos. It is it is fantastic to hear from you, from your perspective, of how uh, important a, proce a process, consensus, and the blend of technological aspects and principles and rights is, is important for building uh, an important governance structure for the digital space. And I think I think one of the, the main points of this initiative is actually to blend all those aspects, the social, the rights, the principles, and obviously the technological aspects in order to create this building blocks, the starting point of a, a more global interoperable initiative. And in view of that, we have proposed to discuss now with the audience 12 principles as a starting point. It's obviously uh, obviously open to a major discussion on what we're going to go, how we're going to discuss this. Uh, and obviously the idea is to, to see what you're going to talk about process, what you think about the rights, what you think about principles. And then I'll put it. You're on mute, Christian. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, folks. So I'm going to put on the chat so that you can have a little bit of a, a look as well of the 12 starting points, 12 aspects that we can discuss. And now, uh, if anyone wants to raise their hands to discuss or uh, write something on the chat, otherwise, uh, I think we can we can start having an idea of what it is the the main social aspect that we consider they're going to be the 
most basic starting point. And I think when you look at the Marco Civil, we had this aspect of having a basic legislation that has as a bulk uh, uh, rights and, and principles as, as this starting point. So I would uh, lend the floor to see if anyone wants to contribute. Otherwise, uh, I would uh, ask Ronaldo to go for it and, and give us what was the main idea behind those specific starting point principles that we had in the Marcos Seville? Absolutely, Christian. So uh, I think the point here uh, is the following. I think as Sarah and Juan Carlos mentioned, because of the pandemic, I think we all agree that the digital infrastructure and the digital capability transformation and so on has become a key component of uh, the lives that we have today, of resilience, of uh, you know uh, everything that we need to do in order to uh, basically deal with a crisis, a global crisis as the pandemic. So I think like uh, if you look into the proposals from people like Yuval Harari, he basically talks about creating a sort of an antivirus for the world, right? Not speaking only about the virus itself, but also about protecting the stability, resilience, and availability of the cyber infrastructure that we have today, because it has basically proven itself as absolutely crucial for going through a global crisis as the one we are still going through. So I think that, that is a point of consensus. So that's the first thing I would like to, to talk about before we delve into the principles. Second thing is we are not alone. So we are here basically talking about a post-pandemic digital rights initiative. And I think one of, of the tasks of an initiative like this is precisely to look into what has been made so far what are the other initiatives that are happening all over the world in order to deal with these problems? Sometimes these initiatives are focused on a specific problem like uh, artificial intelligence, other are, are focused on cybersecurity, other are, are focused you know, on algorithmic bias and discrimination and so on. And, realizing that we are not alone in this initiative and that there are so many interesting and important projects that have happened and are already happening uh, as we speak here. I think that, that is very important. So recognizing those initiatives, in my view, is important and also mapping uh, what are their proposals and what seems to be the topics and the consensus that might emerge from these initiatives and from the work that has been uh, made so far. Final point is, uh, I mentioned in, in, in my first talk about the importance of participatory technologies. And I really think like part of the problem that we are facing right now is because we have delegated a lot of decisions to algorithms as a sort of a replacement for uh, collective participation. So one challenge that feels to me absolutely crucial is how do we bring back participatory technologies that uh, in the 2000s were basically flourishing? And I think the, the most important example of that is Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a, a, an innovation, not in terms of technology itself, but it's an innovation in terms of governance on how people can organize themselves, even people that have never met, in order to achieve a common goal and to come up with a collective work that is actually very sound and important. And of course, we're not in the 2000s anymore, and we have so much more possibilities right now. We have so uh, many more tools and infrastructure and possibilities of participation that range from uh, quadratic voting, pairwise methodologies and 
you know, you, you can name like uh, so many different initiatives. And I think we, we can bring that back into the debate again. So in my view, we are on a very important and ripe time in order to propose this post-pandemic digital initiatives. And if we take these three elements together, uh, basically recognizing the importance of principles and agreeing with those principles and setting those principles beforehand, understanding that we are not alone and recognizing the other initiatives and bringing back participatory technologies rather than uh, algorithmic decision-making, I think we can create a mood stakeholder process that can be quite successful for doing that. So Christian, I welcome the principles that you have shared. I have, I'm, I'm looking at them uh, right now and I'll be very happy to discuss each one of them and to approach them uh, in a way, you know, that resonates with uh, this challenge that we have ahead. And indeed, Ronaldo, I think you have, you mentioned two of the most important parts of this, the, this bigger discussion, which is uh, how do we establish this process in, in a global way? How do you establish consensus in, in a global way? And, and obviously having different methodologies is, is a very important starting point. And this is one of the things that we wanted to reflect in the principles as well, just at an extent to expand the possibilities, uh, methodological possibilities of creating uh, a governance uh, ecosystem for, for, for the world, to an extent, for the whole digital space and globally speaking. Uh, one important aspect as well is what are the main tenets of our, uh, that we're gonna move towards the digital rights initiatives. And one of the tenets that you wanted to bring uh, through these principles, not a principle in itself, but through the principles is for instance, interoperability. So we are, we are facing a world that we have, as Sarah mentioned, many different initiatives, most of them national. So we want to find ways to maintain our, uh, our national values, but also making them potentially interoperable within different types of regulation. So uh, starting point, building a consensus on the basis of principles and rights, this is uh, facilitate the possibility of an interoperable uh, working system globally. And uh, on this note, I uh, wanted to open the floor to see whether Sarah and Juan Carlos want to contribute and say some words about uh, the main basis of principles that we're going to discuss and whether you have anything to add on, on potential procedures that we want to go to move on through this, uh, this initiative. So Sarah and Juan Carlos, do you have anything to add from a starting point of what are the, the main tenets that we're going to move, we should move forward? I think just a short observation that I think you can see we've drawn inspiration from Marco Seville in setting out what the principles, because you, again, it's a model where you've got principles that have held up over the, over the test of time and seemingly have only become more relevant, e even if there are some changes at the margins. And the, and the other thing I'd say is, I think interoperability is going to become more key over time as each national jurisdiction fills out its framework across multiple different areas of technology policy. And it's striking to me that that isn't discussed more often. Uh, and so when you look at those principles, as I sort of flagged before, I think you can see some that, that there is tension between some of those principles. Uh, and what I would be interested in is um, contributions from other people on whether you think there's anything that's been omitted or anything that's been included that perhaps shouldn't be or has the potential to sink the overall objective. You know, are, are we not, are there some issues that aren't ready for a principled approach? Um, because as Christian knows, you know, ideally would have 10, I think it's just a nice, um, but, but it's very hard to ignore areas that, that are ripe for consideration on like how an interoperable framework could work. And Sarah, before Juan Carlos steps in, that is a very important thing, editing what we are proposing, right? So when we did the micro view, one example was 
we decided not to talk about intellectual property rights within the micro civil because if we knew that if we were going to do that that would have basically killed uh, the project from the outset so i think you're absolutely right so when i look into the principles here i absolutely see some that are uh truly global in nature so for instance uh protecting the internet stability and functionality by all technical means, protecting, uh, you know, issues regarding infrastructure security and cyber resilience. Others might not have like that, that outreach. So I, I completely agree with you that we have to focus on those. And I, I think we all welcome inputs about how to do that. And because that's part of the design decisions that we need to, to make. Uh, one, if I may, one quick comment is uh, that uh, um, we also have to think about the relationship with this internet or digital principles uh, and uh, the basic fundamental principles which are typically enshrined in our constitutions. Because during this pandemic, uh, we've seen some of those rights uh, come strongly under stress. Um, I speak for Italy and uh, we see a surprising amount uh, of stress on freedom of expression. Uh, in just in recent days, we have had very prominent figures in our political landscape uh, say things like, um, uh, you know, we should be less democratic about what we say on television. Uh, we heard uh, famous journalists say, uh, talking to an expert, uh, come on, doctor, you shouldn't be saying that on television in prime time. Even it, we are not questioning the, whether it was true or not, whether it was appropriate in the scientific sense or not. But we have a very strong pressure on it's definitely freedom of expression and also other, other fundamental principles. So maybe we should take in consideration, uh, especially if this pandemic uh, draws, you know, continues for some time, and I'm afraid it will continue for some more time. Think about the interplay between you know, the actual fundamental constitutional principles and these other principles that we care about. So we care about both, of course. And actually, the second, the, the, the latter are based on the former. So that's maybe the comment I would like to make at the beginning. Indeed, indeed, Juan Carlos. I think that that's one of the main uh, the main tenets that we try to express through this through this initiative. So we also have to think about the the internal constitutional principles and rights and how it it may have attention towards uh, a more global effort. And if you look at, uh, we have to actually boil down uh, the basic major principle of freedom of expression, for instance, to the, to the realities, but continue to make this uh, interoperable within the different nations as well. And there are a few of, uh, obviously, we are trying to propose some of the principles that are a bit more uh, on the edge of what it is seen as uh, traditional uh, rights and principles. For instance, when you're talking about sustainable development and inter intergenerational justice, this is obviously something that is being discussed and it's been uh, created throughout uh, bringing consensus worldwide, but still it is not uh, as traditional principles, I would say, and rights as, as freedom of expression. So it would be interesting to see uh, since we are in a toll hall, what are the main ideas, whether we, this is something that may achieve uh, international consensus within, you know, the different and uh, the global aspects that we are doing now. Other principle that it is uh, quite interesting is obviously we, uh, most people or I wouldn't assume anyone would disagree that children should be protected in the digital space, but do you think this is a principle that has achieved the global substantial uh, consensus that uh, it, it should be one of the main tenets for uh, the future or post pandemic digital rights uh, space, let's put it this way. So this is uh, the types of, types of discussions that we wanted to see. And from the, the standpoint of our participants here, it would be interesting to see what are the other potential tensions that we were, you already see. Uh, uh, for instance, do you think that uh, access to the a right of access to the internet has achieved this level of global 
uh, consensus as well or, or not? What are the main specificities that we can we can have? Yep, if, if I can follow up on what Juan Carlos mentioned about uh, freedom of expression, uh, I think probably freedom of expression is the intellectual property issue of our times. Uh, not because uh, it's unimportant, it's precisely because of the opposite, because so many national states and regions are already working uh, with that issue from a normative perspective. I think the, the, the is probably following its own course. So in your uh, freedom of, of expression norms it has not been turned into legislation yet. It was approved in one commission uh, in the Brazilian Congress. And if you look around the globe, th there are so many uh, other initiatives doing just that. So my fear is if we uh, deal with this particular issue, we might be basically engulfed by it and basically uh, not being able to move forward be precisely because it's already happening at so many instances at the national level. But yeah. that, that is one reflection. And yeah, I, let me- I just, I just wanna echo, I just wanna echo and, and support that as I do worry. Um, and again, it goes to back to the perfect being the enemy of the good, um, that you can have just one, one issue that sinks the entire initiative. And just to abstract that upper level, I don't think, and, and I'd love the more, far more qualified Brazilian citizens on this call to um, correct me. I don't think Marco Seville could be passed now in its current state. Uh, and so I think some of the, the principles that to us look relatively uncontroversial um, in this moment in 2021 are going to become more contestable over time. And so there is a strong argument to where we can see existing norms and consensus, codifying them in some way before they come under pressure and that common ground shrinks further. If I, if I make uh, just a very quick uh, uh, comment on that. Yes, I understand tactically what you say. However, as, at least for Italy, I don't know about other countries, uh, what I see is that we do not have initiatives on freedom of expression in the traditional sense. Uh, because I think that governments, at least in Europe, if they tried to restrict freedom of expression, the constitutional courts, they would stop it. There's no way they're going to change to such you know, decades of, of jurisprudence uh, on freedom of expression, but we do see attempts to restrict freedom of expression online on digital platforms, not using laws, but using a sort of soft power and, and regu softer regulation, etc. So, uh, in my regard, my I raised this issue not because I wanted to raise a, a difficult potential stamp, uh, you know, uh, obstacle to the to this initiative, but because I do see a specific effort in trying to bypass the traditional protection for freedom of expression on the digital domain, using something you know softer than than laws. That's it. I don't want to focus too much on this topic. I think what that, that's a great point. Yeah. I was just going to say that that's uh, one of the important issues that why we have this, this initiative, because not only the courts, but we, we should have a governance system that will support this logic. But I, I hand it over to obviously to Ronaldo Lemos for more. No, no just a quick comment. I think we are talking about uh, issues that uh, should be edited from the, the, the list of principles. And also you mentioned, Christian, issues that are being left out, right? So it, one of them, in my perspective, is the, the whole debate about uh, a decentralized uh, internet, what is being called the Web 3.0. And I think that there is a lot of consensus right now about the problems of excessive 
centralization. I think we, we've been talking a, a lot about that. However, I think we are going to face, as Sarah mentioned, issues that right now might not seem controversial later on in time, might become extremely controversial. And one of them, in my view, is precisely the movement we are seeing happening uh, in the direction of building decentralized permissionless networks uh, that you know can operate upon themselves and not really rely on a company or in a government on individuals but on the networks themselves so this is an issue that i think it's in the very initial stages right now but it's one that i i would also like to see which is how do we deal not only with the problems of centralization but also the problems of um, decentralization especially when it's embedded in the network itself fantastic i think there are obviously um, more than one issues in terms of decentralization we also have have seen this this logic of splinter net as well to a certain extent so uh, it's important for us to to see uh interoperability as one of ba a basic tenets not only in the sense of, of legal interoperability not only in the, the, in the sense of interoperability of different systems but also the interoperability of this decentralized uh internet system so having uh, um, common ground might so might help us build uh, a system that is actually interoperable. I think we are reaching our final time. Uh, I don't think there is uh, going to be more strong contributions from the audience. So I would like to propose us two minutes each to have some some thoughts. What are going to be the future? What are the main aspects we should look at? in order to build up upon uh, a digital space that is actually interoperable, that's based on consensus, that's based on a process that uh, involves different voices, different stakeholders. So if I may have a, a round of final two minutes for each of you, that would be fantastic. So can I start with Ronaldo as well? Thank you, Chris. I'll be very quick. So from my perspective, I think, uh, we should be excited with this possibility of advancing uh, once again the discussion about a Bill of Rights. It has to be one that fits with the challenges that we are having at this particular moment. And, and as I mentioned, I think the, the list of principles that you came up uh, with so far, we came up with so far, they're a, a great uh, initial list. And of course, our challenge is going to get feedback and edit that list and also include some points that might not be added so far and use everything that we discussed here in terms of participatory uh, approaches, multi-stakeholderism, and everything that the Marco Civil inspired and made possible in Brazil to basically ignite the discussion and bring it like a, to a level that I think it can effectively contribute to the challenge that we are having now. So thank you, Christian, for the moderation. Thank you very much, Ronaldo. Can I ask Sarah for two minutes on final notes, how to ignite this initiative as Ronaldo mentioned? I think part of it is understanding that there is this limited window of opportunity and, the, and creating some urgency around it. Part of the challenge that I see is we, that we tend to be very reactive, whether we sit in civil society or academia or industry, and don't tend to project out five years or 10 years. And, and Ronaldo, that's why I think it's helpful to bring up, you know, what does a decentralized internet mean for these set of principles? Like, um, and to me, that goes back to the, this point that I, I think hopefully we leave the session with, which is, it sounds, ambitious and sort of like a nice thing to have and it doesn't you know it doesn't seem like a a daily necessity this is you know this is not food water survival and i i remember when we first pitched to the un including internet access in the sdgs and they were, they, you know they're like people are starving why would you be talking about the internet uh, and and i think sometimes it's good to be early to an issue and to appreciate the urgency behind it 
we will look back, I'm confident, if we have this discussion and, and you know, inshallah we do in five years or 10 years and say, look, there was a real moment there to create some global norms, to create some interoperable frameworks. And that moment has passed and, and our ambition has to scale back even further. So I think being very pragmatic and saying, you know, let's drop anything that could sink this and let's see where we can start to build from the ground up something. And hopefully that will become a basis where we can build and build and build over time. And, and I, I see it as urgent. Um, and I see that we will look, look back on this time and not realize how much opportunity we had. Fantastic. I think that's the note that we have to finish, uh, the opportunities of the future. So Juan Carlos, what do you think about that? Your final two words. Two minutes. Uh, yes, pretty much following on, on Sarah's remarks, uh, uh, I do think that um, these uh, efforts uh, for uh, to establish digital rights in the past several years, uh, for a long time, have been um, with some a few exceptions, uh, uh, a niche initiative of, of people like us and our community and other communities, but definitely not something reaching the mass. At least in, the, in Italy, that was not the case, and this pandemic. Uh, as indeed, as we said at the beginning, and Sarah also reminded us just a moment ago, this pandemic has made uh, uh, hundreds of millions of people, if not billions, uh, touch with their hands of what it means to, to have certain digital rights or, to, or not have them for education, for work, for your personal life, etc. So I do think that this pandemic is, um, is an opportunity so many horrible things, but also the possibility of being an opportunity to exploit the awareness, the new awareness that digital technologies is not just simply a luxury, it's not only you know, Netflix, or it's definitely part of your life. And if you do not have proper digital rights, you can, have, uh, you can suffer very concrete consequences, consequences on your life, on the education of your children, on your job, on your health. So this is an opportunity, and uh, I would be moving forward. Uh, I think we can now seek to uh, establish broader alliances. So uh, to get out of our space and to have uh, more easily alliances with, you know, civil society organizations, political parties, uh, political movements, uh, trade unions. You know, I've been talking the other day with a prominent. Uh, trade union leader in Italy and trade unions in the last five years that made an enormous change in their awareness and understanding of what it means technology, digital technology. So maybe that's that could be this opportunity, maybe it's where we can establish a, a stronger push to establish digital rights on an international level. Fantastic. I think that's that's the end of our, our discussion today. And that's the end idea. So we have to establish uh, a starting point based on a broad consensus and broad view. And, and as Juan Carlos mentioned, we uh, the masses have become aware of the importance of digitalization, the importance of the digital space. So this is also uh, one interesting point to see how base our global initiative on rights and, and consensual principles may be a very good uh, basis for uh, international, global, interoperable governance uh, regime or institutional arrangement. So thank you very much. And this is the start of a very broad discussion that should move forward in the future. Thank you. Thank you.